Community Care and Wise, Women in Search of Excellence, and Employee Resource Group here at Cleveland Clinic welcome you to Let's Talk About Us, What Cleveland Clinic Caregivers Should Know About COVID-19 Vaccine. My name is Terry Mulder hines I am one of the co-chairs of WISE and the director of the Office of Caregiver Experience. So welcome and thank you for joining us this afternoon. We are pleased to have with us today, Dr. Susan Ream, who is the vice president, uh, vice chair, I'm sorry, of Infectious Disease Department. Dr. Rita Pappas, who is the president of Women's Professional Staff Association, medical director, hospital operations, Cleveland Clinic, staff, pediatric hospital medicine, Cleveland Clinic Children's, and Dr. Michelle Medina, Associate Chief, Clinical Operations, Cleveland Clinic Community Care. What a mouthful and how blessed we are to have them here with us today to talk about COVID-19 and the effects on our community and how we can talk about it a little bit more and answer some of your questions. The session will be open for Q&A please see on your screen the Q&A button and please feel free to ask questions throughout our afternoon. We will make sure that we ask our panelists the questions as they come through. Have questions, please type them in your chat box to be read and answered live. We will answer as many questions as time allows. This meeting is being recorded and will also be available for viewing later. So let's get started. So even though caregivers are the first line of defense, we still may have questions and hesitancy about receiving the COVID-19 vaccine. Some caregivers' concerns are, and here is where I'm going to hand it, hand it to you, ladies. These are some of our questions, right? So as we think about these top four concerns, please feel free to jump in and offer your opinion, your ideas, your experiences. One of the top questions is safety and possible long-term effects of vaccines. How safe are the available COVID-19 vaccines? That's one question. The other top question is how effective are the vaccines in preventing COVID-19? It helped me understand how I can protect my family and community from COVID-19. And what do I need to do to schedule a COVID-19 vaccine? So those are some hard hitter questions. Just wanted to give you all four so you can kind of Feel free to answer in your comfort zone or your area of expertise. I'm sure our audience is eager to hear. What are your thoughts? Did I I start? Start? Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Terry. Thank you, everybody, for, for having us here. Really great opportunity to be able to speak to people directly and answer their questions. Um, and I will definitely call him Dr. Reeb was my lifeline um, <laughs> to respond to all of the science. But let me just say it unequivocally today. These are safe, these are effective vaccines. Over 150 million Americans that have received at least one dose. When you're talking about numbers as large as that, you're going to see signals of whether anything is really significantly wrong with the vaccines. It's really hard to imagine that you've given that many doses. You know, if you think about all the other vaccines combined that we typically give now over many, many decades, think about that. We actually were able to do all of that in like just the space of several months. So when you think about that number and you still don't see any major significant side effects, and that includes what we saw with the Johnson & Johnson pause, right? Um, these are safe vaccines. The question of whether long-term we're going to see anything, well, again, that's something that time will tell. We have experience of these vaccines that are less than a year. But again, given the, given the theoretic um, way that the vaccines actually work, given the fact that we've given it out so much, you know, I myself personally feel a really big um, safety um, confidence in these as far as what will happen and how they will play out. And in terms of being effective, we have so much data now, not just what happened when they were studying the vaccines. We have data from many different countries, including the United States, of how effective they are in terms of uh, preventing COVID infections, decreasing the number of cases in the community, decreasing the amount of hospitalizations, decreasing the amount of deaths. And we don't even have to go far. We now have data within our own caregiver group that actually tells us if you're vaccinated, 
your chance of getting COVID, your chance of getting hospitalized, your chance of ending up in the ICU is so minuscule, right? Almost barely nothing, less than one or less than half a percent even. Um, and so we have all of that data now to actually answer that question. Michelle, I couldn't agree. I, I couldn't agree more. And and I well, one thing that I think a lot about is uh, our experience with other vaccines. And I'm going to use influenza for an example. You know, we we recommend, we actually require as a healthcare system that we get influenza vaccine every year. Mm -hmm. And that vaccine, in a good year, it's very difficult to tell exactly how effective it is, but it may be somewhere around fifty percent. We're talking about vaccines that are in excess of 95, maybe up to 98 or 99 percent effective. It's unheard of. Uh, it's it's really quite remarkable. So uh, I, I think you know this is a moment to celebrate. Yeah. Uh, as in the midst of all of the the trauma and the awful things about COVID, the the move in this vaccine technology over a very short period of time with super effective vaccines, I think is, is really remarkable. And we're, we're so privileged to be able to have access to them as a matter of fact, kind of enhanced access to them in some cases because, because of the work that we do. Uh, I, I am absolutely thrilled that the, ex, the uh, indications for vaccination have been extended as well. I know Michelle and, and Rita uh, as pediatricians are very excited <laughs> about the fact that we've now opened this up to 12 to 15 year olds too. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Medina and Dr. Reen. As you reference the flu vaccine, and I know that that's something that we receive uh, annually, what are your thoughts around this new COVID vaccine? Do you think it is something that may eventually be incorporated in an annual uh, basis? Or I know there was a question sent in about, um, about that. What are your, any thoughts in regards to timing or frequency of vaccination? Um, Terry, if we could step back for a second, I just wanted to comment too. So as a, as a, on the previous question, so as a mother and as a physician, I think the best testament about whether the vaccine is safe and effective is the fact that I've been immunized and I've immunized my own children. So my 19 year old and my 16 year old are both immunized. And so when you see our Cleveland Clinic family coming together and the, our physicians coming forward and vaccinating not only themselves, but their children, then I think that's the best testament that we can give as a healthcare organization that this vaccine is safe and effective. You know, I, I'm hoping, and then for your second question, I don't have a crystal ball and, you know, reading the literature and looking, I think it's too early to determine yet what's going to happen in terms of repeated vaccinations. But I'm sure that um, if we follow closely what the CDC is doing, as well as our own infectious disease colleagues in terms of following the literature, we'd be able to comment more frequently and some further communications. I'm, I don't know, Susan, if you think any differently about that. Oh, it, it's too soon to tell, but but yeah. you know, given the advances in vaccine technology, wouldn't it be cool to imagine yeah. a, a, a once once a year vaccine that would cover several respiratory viruses? Yeah, most well, definitely. You, you never know; it, uh, it it might be a possibility. Yeah, I think we truly did experience the the um, art of the science and how fabulous and what what great times we live in in regards to. The level of science we were able to uh, pull upon and receive such a, a, a great vaccine, right, in such short length of time. Uh, we can't speak to that. One of the things that you did reference, uh, Dr. Medina, and one of our caregivers asked about herd immunity. What exactly does that mean? What is herd immunity? You know, we have these things, birds, words, and topics that are kind of shown, uh, discussed on the news daily and we don't quite understand what does that mean and how are we part of that and what role does that really play? What significance is that? I don't really like that word because I think it reminds people of cows. Yeah, I, <laughs> but, yeah, I agree. Um, the, the, the word or at least the concept that I prefer and it's true, especially because I'm a pediatrician, is the notion of circling the wagons, yeah. right? 
when you have, when you circle the wagons and you basically put in around, you know, it's it sort of in the perimeter, those who are strongest, those who are, you know, vaccinated, those who now have the advantage of actually repelling something mm -hmm. that's coming our way, then it allows the vulnerable people in the center of the wagons to remain protected. And the vulnerable people at the center of the wagons are those who can't get the vaccine or are too young to get the vaccine or are too frail to get the vaccine. So when we talk about herd immunity, that's essentially what we're doing. We're, we're giving as many people the vaccine so that now you're able to circle the wagons and that circle is huge and that circle is well reinforced and that circle is very, very strong so that we're able to protect our infants, we're able to protect the elderly, we're able to protect those who are immune compromised who can't get the vaccine and are in danger of really suffering greatly if they happen to get COVID. I love that concept, Michelle, and kind of the cocooning, you know, <laughs> that, that protection around there. And, and I'll, I'll put into the center of that circle, people who receive the vaccine who might not get protection from it. While it is extraordinarily useful and helpful, we're getting more information about the most immunosuppressed people. So I'm talking about bone marrow transplants, other organ transplant recipients, uh, people who have really suppressed immune systems. Their response is not as good as it is for people whose immune systems are intact. So that's another element of circling the wagon. And, and it's particularly relevant, I think, to all of us who are in healthcare as well as who are in communities, because we have to do everything we can to set up this protective circle so that those people whose immune system isn't strong enough uh, have some protection as well. And there is the one other concept, you know, I agree, some people don't like herd immunity, so the community immunity is another term that's used. And what I like to think about is, you know, how much virus is circulating out there? Mm -hmm. you know, so the more people who are vaccinated, the less virus that's circulating. The more people who are using masks and protective equipment yeah. and staying out of crowds and all of those things, the less virus there is out there in the air. And one reason that that's important in addition to protecting people against infection, but another really important, maybe a little bit nerdy infectious disease thing is that the less uh, virus there is out there, the, the chances of mutation go way down, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. way down. So everything that we can do to just get that long, I'm going to call it community viral load down, yeah. will reduce the chances of these awful mutations that you know we, we're still learning about. Most definitely. Thank you so much. I like the uh, circling the wagon. That does feel a little bit better than the herd immunity. And definitely thanks for explaining it make great sense. Dr. Pappish, you bring up, which is definitely um, in the same uh, level of conversation, you know, our children and our youth, uh, really, you know, not some, at a certain age, not being able to receive the vaccine as of yet. But then also there are myths uh, for certain age ranges in regards to apprehension that's uh, in, in receiving the vaccines. What are some of your thoughts or experiences um, in regards to, you know, some of our younger generation receiving the vaccine and there being myths, I'll share one is, um, you know, them not being able to, you know, um, bear children or infertility, um, things like that. And I'm using these terms just because this is what you're hearing them say, right? And what's in the news. So what right. are your thoughts? Um, I know you have younger children yourself, um, <laughs> along with being a, a physician in regards to some of those apprehensions? Yeah, I've tried um, within my own community outside of work to try to dispel those myths. Um, it seems that the internet is propagating a lot of these myths, especially the most recent one about fertility. Mm -hmm. And so um, in having that conversation, one of the things I think about is I, I said, the you know, let, let's talk about this. The vaccine hasn't been out very long. How is it impacting fertility? So where did this information come from? 
And so oftentimes my friends will share me or share an article with me, and then we'll go through the article step by step and disprove a lot of the, the myths. And I don't blame people. I think they're worried and they're hungry for information, but it's quite clear that having the vax or having being immunized now will not impact your fertility or your children's fertility moving forward. In fact, if you think about the other vaccinations that we've given all of our children, it's not impacted fertility um, at all in terms of um, the current vaccinations that we do give our children. So trying to dispel the myths by one, actively listening, two, going to the literature, and three, just um, having a, a conversation. I don't know, Michelle, if you have anything to add about that and counseling patients and their families. And then the one thing that I that we also talk about when we develop communication or even among um, different uh, clinical groups that you, you do have to meet people where they are, right? Some of them, some of them are very much, um, you know, uh, anxious about this message. And sometimes you can't even get past to the next conversation un until you really you know, uh, reassure them as far as this particular issue. And, and some just need like a little bit of reassurance that, yeah, I've heard that, but, you know, tell me what you think and, and then I'll be fine. So I think that concept of really meeting people where they are and, and getting to the heart of what it is that they're concerned about um, is key in these conversations. I know that there have been a couple questions that have come through the uh, Q&A chat. Please feel free to uh, answer, uh, ask us as many questions as you have. I know there are physicians as well behind the scene answering some questions as they come through, but I'd like to share them with our physicians on online here today. Should I be concerned about the long-term effects of the vaccine? Long-term meaning a couple months now, but what is the long-term <laughs> effect? <laughs> um, or what may be the long-term effects or how can we kind of help people feel more comfortable um, with taking the vaccine in fear of long-term after effects. Any thoughts? I mean, I can start. Um, I don't think I'll ever tell anybody not to be concerned. These are really extraordinary times. I think we're concerned about a lot of different things, right? The question is not whether you should be concerned. The question is whether that concern, um, is significant enough for us to actually not move forward mm -hmm. with an action that's clearly very beneficial to ourselves, to our families, to our communities, you know, um, you know, to our region. So like anything else, um, you can put in one bucket the theoretical risk, right? Something that we don't know versus what we do know, which is how effective it is that is that we have given it to so many people without any significant side effects. And that the, the nature by which these vaccines act really does not necessarily tell us that there's anything that can happen in the long term just because of how we understand how they work. So when you compare what you don't know and what you're afraid of versus what you know, I think that's, that's the question that people have to ask themselves the confidence that you have in what you do know versus you know, centering on what you're worried about that really may or may not happen. And again, I'm never gonna say that to anybody, you shouldn't be concerned, but, they, but the balance that people should be making in their heads is, is sort of, I think, in that sense. Um, Rita, Sue, you know, happy to hear your thoughts about that. No, I, I'm aligned with you, Michelle. I, I mean, in, we're in a pandemic. This is a very scary time, never in our history like that. In our lifetime, have we experienced anything like this? And so um, being concerned, I think, is perfectly rational. But I would echo what, what Michelle said. When I looked at getting a vaccine and not being hospitalized and not being in a ventilator and not having the chance of dying versus not doing anything and taking my chances and being concerned, I chose to act. And so and by acting, I mean I, I took the vaccine. And so I think that's one of the things that it, I want to reassure everyone too, is that you, you have to be comfortable with your choice. And for me, that was the choice I was willing to take, knowing that the vaccine has such great and is so effective about being hospitalized or even 
um, dying. <laughs> so these were the two things that I kind of put in the top tier of my decision making versus getting the vaccine. And so that's why I got the vaccine. Yeah, great point. You know, in order to move forward, we have to right. kind of weigh our pros and cons and mm -hmm. uh, make the best decision. Dr. Reem, to shift a little bit, can you speak to the variants um, in the vaccine, uh, especially from India and what we're seeing in India? What are your yes, thoughts? So um, and you all remember that we started hearing about variants uh, quite a few months ago. I think the, the British variant was the first one that we heard about, uh, followed rapidly by South Africa and, and Brazil. And then more recently, um, there's one that's actually named a California India mutant. Uh, it, and that is one of several so-called double mutants. The reality is that the double mutations are in, in the world of viruses are they're quite common. But the question is some of these some of these mutations make the viruses more easily acquired or transmitted and they may sometimes cause worse disease. So the what is evolving about what is known about vaccines and, and the variants, is like I say, it is evolving. Uh, for example, it appears that both the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine are quite active against the British variant. Hmm. The, uh, the people who have, were receiving AstraZeneca vaccine, which is not available in the United States, but, but was in testing in South Africa, there was uh, some reduction in coverage for these South African variants in their trial. So we know that there's possibilities that that the vaccines are not going to cover all of the mutants. What uh, and what is so important, it gets back to what we were saying earlier, is the more rapidly we can get people vaccinated, not only in the United States but all over the world, the the lower the chances that there are going to be additional mutations that go on that will impact the viruses or the, excuse me, the vaccine's uh, effectiveness. Um, it is one of the things that's being kept on the radar screen in terms of boosters or annual, uh, annual uh, immunizations. This is not exactly like influenza, so I don't want to really draw that line. But what I do want to say is that uh, everyone will be keeping their eye on the ball in terms of of whether tweaks to the vaccine will be, or vaccines, I should say, plural, will be useful in terms of addressing these mutants. So it is a, it's a very changing scene. I think the answer at this moment is that we, we're we're in good shape as far as the match between the vaccine and the and the variants are concerned, but. Uh, we need to keep our foot on the accelerator in yeah. terms of, of getting people vaccinated. Michelle, I know that you've, you've dealt with this as well and you referenced the fact that we, we've got some studies in-house uh, in terms of vaccine efficacy. Uh, that might, This might be a good time to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, um, so, and actually one of Dr. Reem's colleagues as well, one of our infectious disease colleagues looked at our data. So remember when we started vaccinating caregivers starting in December and looked at the information starting from December to April when the bulk of our currently vaccinated caregivers, you know, were getting the vaccine and basically tracked over time who was getting vaccinated, who remained not vaccinated and is there a difference by which these two groups were picking up or getting infected with COVID? Mm -hmm. And as soon as you actually fall into the group that got vaccinated, your risk of getting COVID, as I said, fell almost to zero. It's not completely zero, but it's so, so tiny compared to the group that remained not vaccinated during this time and their the rate that they continued to pick up COVID pretty much mirrored what we continued to see in the community. That in fact, to Dr. Reem's point, 
when we look at the Pfizer data and they say it's 95% effective, well, guess what? In our setting, it was closer to 98% effective in preventing people from getting COVID. If you look at it the other way, when you take a look at all the folks, all the patients that have now been admitted to the Cleveland Clinic since the campaign started to vaccinate the community, all the people who were um, admitted to the hospital or sent to the ICU, the vast majority, the vast majority have not been vaccinated. So what does that tell you? When you remain not vaccinated, you clearly will continue to have the same risk of picking up COVID, of getting sick, of ending up in the hospital. And if you happen to fall in any of those categories, as far as age, having a medical condition, your risk is even higher compared to anybody else, right? So you leave yourself completely vulnerable if you remain in the group that is not vaccinated. That's a beautiful expl explanation, Michelle. And I'll just add that we know that the B117, the British variant, Mm -hmm. is the predominant variant in our community right now. And again, to emphasize how effective this, these vaccines are against that particular variant, we are not seeing breakthrough for vaccinated people getting infected with the B117 variant. So I think we not only do we have overseas data, we've got our own domestic data that suggests that. Wonderful. Any thoughts, Dr. Pappas? You're on mute. <laughs> I'm sorry, I had a tickle in my throat. You, and by the way, yourself on mute. <laughs> <laughs> um, I need to make a donation to the hardship fund because once every once you're on mute, you <laughs> you try to speak your speech. I'll make a donation to the hardship fund. No, no, no comments at all. I think you know um, one of the things I just wanted to share too anecdotally. I agree with. Um, Dr. Reams' uh, comments about the variant, but it was such so nice on Mother's Day this Sunday that I was all of us were vaccinated, and it's the first time I've hugged my parents in over a year, and so it was really really special, and you know, yes, and to be able to do that and know that we were all protected, um, we waited until all of the kids were vaccinated, and so really really wonderful to be able to do that, you know. To, have the opportunity to do that when I haven't been able to do that for over a year. Thank you for sharing that. We did yeah. have, uh, we're able to see each other that we haven't seen yeah. for quite a while. And hopefully that will continue as we walk into additional holidays. Yeah, and, yeah. and following yeah. the CDC yeah. guidelines too. <laughs> <laughs> Great. One of the questions though, that came up in the Q and A and caregivers have asked, um, well, in emailing us prior to today, just really wanting to know if they've had COVID and have the antibodies, what are the benefits then to receiving the vaccine? There's a lot of, you know, conversation in regards to, is it still beneficial to get the vaccine if I've, if I've had COVID? Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts in regards to that? I know there's a lot of chitter chatter between people in the community around I've had COVID, I don't need the vaccine or yeah, those type of comments. What are your thoughts? Well, I'll, I'll start out at I, I think <laughs> this is another evolving area. Yeah. However, we do recommend that people who have had COVID get vaccinated. We recommend that they, uh, they can wait 90 days or so before they do that. Uh, that's a CDC recommendation. Um, and uh, the, the concern is that having had COVID means that you've been exposed to perhaps one particular uh, variety and uh, there may be broader protection with, mm -hmm. with the uh, vaccines. And the second compelling reason is that it appears that the duration of protection is longer with the vaccine than it might be with the, the natural illness. Mm -hmm. And that may run counter to what people have in their heads. I've, I've heard people say, oh, it's, it's better to just get the infection and then you've got great antibodies and, and you're, you're ready to go. But the way things are looking, 
uh, it appears that that protection actually may last longer with the vaccines than it does with a natural infection. And then lastly, I'll say, we have to be so careful about paying attention to antibodies as a sign of, of protection, so to speak. Mm -hmm. I, I am not capable of getting into the science, but let me just bottom line, it's really tricky. You can have antibodies and not be protected. You can not have antibodies and be protected. And, and, and really it's, it's a, a tool to be used by epidemiologists who are looking at populations, not at an individual person. Antibody tests are just really tricky. Thank you for that. That was very informative, very much so. Any additional thoughts or uh, you know, insight in regards to the, the three different types of vaccines? I know uh, Johnson & Johnson, Pfizer, uh, Moderna. Any insight in regards to the three different types of vaccines, what the difference may be between, between the three of them? Um, just thoughts around, you know, caregivers sometime will compare, oh, I had Moderna versus Pfizer, I didn't have side effects, or I did with Moderna, you know, <laughs> just the kind of the conversation around, is there one more beneficial than the other? Are they comprised of different, um, you know, variants? Um, what's the difference between the three, if there is any? Just any thoughts around the three different options? Start off with that one. Um, yes, I think this is an area where it gets really, really confusing for people, right? Just think about that. We had the data come out from Pfizer, we had the data come out from Moderna, we had the data come out from Johnson & Johnson, we hear about AstraZeneca, we hear about, right? Yeah. Um, and in so many ways, this is not like shopping for a car. <laughs> it's not possible for you to say that this car goes from zero to 60 in whatever, if that's important to you, and say that that's, the, that's true for something else altogether, right? And that's why I think this, this information is very difficult sometimes to parse. The bottom line, and I've heard this from Dr. Gordon many times, and I've heard this from the other people as well, the best vaccine that you have is really the vaccine that's available to you at the time. We're fortunate that we, that we do have some choice right now in the United States, but, but the one and true statement about all this is that the best vaccine is the vaccine that you're able to get. Now, that being said, Pfizer and Moderna, for all intents and purposes, you could really think of them as very much the same mm -hmm. vaccine, right? There may be some differences. Some people say, oh, you get more side effects with this than the other. Well, yeah, that's, those, are, those are individual things that happen to different people, but for at most, um, you know, for all intents and purposes, they're the same. And then Johnson & Johnson is, is a different product. Again, the single dose makes it so convenient. Both of them do rely on our understanding of the genetic makeup of the virus. And that's how they designed them to fight that very specific genetic code, which if you think about it to Dr. Dream's point, it's just remarkable <laughs> that, that remember, we found out about COVID in December, we had the genetic code in January, we were beginning to design the vaccine in March, right? Based on the genetic knowledge that we have of the vaccine. And, and that is a very, a very important um, weapon for us to be able to fight the vaccine. So both of them rely on that genetic code. They just happen to use that genetic code in slightly different ways. And, and probably the underlying statement um, for both, again, this is probably too simplistic, but, but bear with me, is that they both provide us with a copy that our own immune system can then take, mm -hmm. run it through our own you know, copy machine within our immune system, Yes. Get out copies of the vaccine of the uh, the virus's protein. So now we have an understanding of what we're fighting, and now we have a memory of what we're fighting. So that if we do encounter COVID, we're much better armed to actually do that, right? Um, so baseline, they do use very similar um, um, you know, sort of methodologies, but used in different ways. The one thing that trips up a lot of people is the notion that this is 95, this is 75, this is 85, you know, what's the deal, right? Remember that those numbers happen in settings that were studies, that were trials, which means that in some ways those settings were also a little bit contrived. But now that we have more real world um, numbers, 
what does happen when you actually give this out to many, many people in the real world setting. I think what we're gonna find is that, boy, there's amazing data with Pfizer and Moderna, but Johnson & Johnson is probably not too far behind in terms of really helping us as a whole community really get through the pandemic. Dr. Ring, I know that was very simplistic. But. No, no I, I think it was right on target. And uh, I, I think that, that the people may forget, uh, again, going back to when the vaccine first became available last December, the clinic was so fortunate. Um, we had the resources to invest in the special minus 80 degree refrigerator or fr freezers rather, mm -hmm. uh, and serve as a community resource as well. So we probably got a disproportionate amount of Pfizer vaccine. I would uh, imagine not knowing how it broke down that we, we happened to get it that way, but it was partly because we were unique in our ability to be able to store and manage that thanks to you, the efforts of you and your team, Michelle. So uh, I, I think uh, my point is that we by no means consider that an endorsement. I, I would endorse what you said and, and that is all three of the vaccines are terrifically safe and effective. Uh, and I would take any one that I could um, going forward. Thank you. Uh, we have a question in the Q and A uh, box here. What does the data say about being contagious after getting the vaccine? Can you spread COVID nineteen if you're vaccinated? Thoughts? So, so that data continues to evolve. We do have a study um, that was uh, sponsored by the CDC that came out in I think March where they took um, healthcare workers from different hospitals, right? And as you know, we were the first ones that were getting vaccinated. Mm -hmm. And they followed these healthcare workers, paramedics, nurses, you know, all kinds, um, after they got vaccinated and they kept swabbing them to see, are you going to get the virus? And if you do, we wanna know quickly <laughs> if you are, mm -hmm. right? And again, similar results, very effective, very few people that actually got um, COVID-19. And even the ones that got it, and we found out simply because we swabbed, which meant that they had the asymptomatic infection, mm -hmm. had very, very small viral loads, right? Which meant that even if you actually have COVID infection, the small chance that you get it, and the even smaller chance that you get it and you don't have any symptoms, you really probably don't have enough to pass it on to somebody else. Which is, which is really amazing, right? Um, as far as the ability of, of the vaccine to not only prevent somebody getting sick, but preventing somebody from actually giving it to somebody else unwittingly. I, I think it is remarkable. And, and we also, you know, this helps to put some background behind why we still recommend masking for mm -hmm. people why all of the, you know, masking, hand washing, distancing, all of those things we continue to recommend for a whole variety of reasons that, that are prob probably very obvious. Uh, so once per somebody's vaccinated, uh, a lot of us are still spending a significant portion of our life <laughs> with only the upper part of your face showing. Yes, thank you, Rita. Um, it, because it's, it's right for others, uh, and it's right for ourselves too. And um, the other quick clarification is that none of these vaccines are so-called live vaccines. You know, th there are a few vaccines in the world uh, for other diseases that are live. And, um, but if somebody gets vaccine and then has COVID, they did not get it from the vaccine. They got it because they were exposed in the usual way and the protection of the vaccine had not yet kicked in. We, we had a Thank few residents, for, for example, uh, where that happened. Uh, they, they got their first dose of vaccine. Uh, they somehow had an exposure mm -hmm. and then they got ill with COVID after the first dose uh, that, of vaccine that they had. That's why we've got to continue masks, hand washing, distancing. So you bring up masks and uh, one of our caregivers has asked 
about masks and face shields. You know, they're eager to kind of find out when can I stop wearing masks and face shields. <laughs> And so, um, and I even asked myself that at times, but knowing the benefits of it, but is there kind of a rule of thumb or an idea when it may be appropriate or how many in that community would need to be um, vaccinated in, to feel safe not to wear masks? We've heard kind of the CDC say, if you and your family, so, you know, you've all been, as, as Rita referenced, vaccinated, it's okay to uh, not wear a mask, but what about the community and, and what are your thoughts on, regarding that, that feedback? Yeah, and it, I, it's still too early now. We have active infections. We're currently in our fourth wave of COVID um, where we saw a spike and it's, uh, and so currently, you know, we, we still need to continue to wear masks and, um, and, the, and the goggles. You know, in terms of trying to decide when, you know, I, it, I'm sure there, there's um, a group of people working in the background right now trying to figure out when it would be safe to do that. Um, but currently in Cleveland, right now we're in our fourth wave of COVID, so it wouldn't be appropriate to not wear masks or goggles. So Rita, when you reference fourth wave of COVID, what does that mean? Oh yeah. So when we first started, if you can remember back, back in March, past, I called it a good night. <laughs> March of last year, where there were um, there was a press conference and they they uh, announced our first cases of COVID, and so that was our first um, wave, meaning the number of infections in COVID that came into our community, um, and we saw patients being hospitalized. Um, the mm -hmm. second wave was shortly after. Memorial Day, right around that time. Susan, you can correct me on the chronicity of this, this, my timeline here, is because it's been a very long year. And then we had more cases and infections and hospitalizations again in October, um, November, December. Mm -hmm. um, then our number of cases plateaued, came up high, and then be, and then came down low again. And now we had another increase most recently in our fourth wave. So it seems like an, each wave was around 90 days between, at least initially, between when we saw cases that went up. And a lot of it had to do with in the first and second waves was related to when the governor kind of shut down the state and, and everyone social distanced and then, then the cases went down. And then when people actually relaxed a little bit and the cases went back up again. That's kind of the best way I think I can explain it. I don't, if the others want to wait. That's exactly right. And, and I think that, um, you know, we've certainly thus far, this fourth wave <laughs> seems like it's plateaued uh, yeah. pretty early. Uh, obviously time will tell. Uh, and, you know, you need more than two points to make a, make a line. So uh, every day we're, we're learning more about that, but, but it's clear from our own caregiver data that vaccination has made a huge difference. And I think that we're experiencing that in terms of the community as well. Um, you know, it's been interesting that there's been a slightly higher proportion of ICU cases with the, with the fourth wave. Mm -hmm. uh, there's been a younger population mm -hmm. who's been infected. Uh, so it, it's a little bit different epidemio, uh, epidemiologically than, than past ones have been. Uh, but, you know, uh, it, it is interesting too, this cyclicity, this 90 day thing, uh, which uh, will be terrifically interesting to, to watch going forward. But uh, another reason is so critical to try to get our 12 to 15 year olds vaccinated uh, as much as we can before school again. School has always been a great mixer as they have been workplaces and things like that. It's a great mixer for all kinds of respiratory viruses. And uh, it just happens that this is, this is our respiratory virus of the century. Uh, and so we're going to be paying a lot of attention to that. But the, the more school age kids that we can get, uh, including through college, that we can get vaccinated in the next few months the better off everybody's going to be. And, and to that question about, you know, how do we know when it's time yeah. to ditch the mask, so to speak? Um, we're, we're not going to get ahead of the CDC. 
you know, the CDC is going ultimately going to be the, mm -hmm. the arbiter of when, when that happens, because all of our institutional policies are really uh, consonant with the CDC's recommendations as well. I, I think that, you know, the other question that's embedded in Terry's question is, what about goggles versus mask? Mm -hmm. And that to me is unknown. Uh, that, that was a, a primarily a recommendation that generated with the Hospital Epidemiological Society, mm -hmm. pre-vaccine availability and so on down the line. And it was as much to protect caregivers and protect our workforce as anything else. So I, I think if, if or when things change, that may be one of the first things that changes, but I have no idea about the timing on it. Recommendation. Thank you, thank you. Caregivers want to know your recommendations for keeping children safe as vaccinated parents begin to expand activity. So I'll just say that um, when we vaccinated a lot of the elderly, yeah. you know, we started seeing more and more cases in young um, adults, but also more and more cases actually even in kids. We must remember that in the last few waves, the largest increase in cases was actually in children. Not, there's not a whole lot of them compared to the rest, but when you look at you know, how they went up, it was a big, big, steep rise as far as children, right? Mm -hmm. So amongst themselves, as, as, as Dr. Reem said, they're, they're just, there's, there's no way to, to not have that mixing happen when they're in school, when they're in sports, when they're in events, when they're in sleepovers, you know, all the things that we associate with what a normal, you know, yeah. sort of summer or school year should look like. Um, when parents are protected, and in some ways, again, speaking to that cocooning effect, that's great because if they're the ones who are going out and about in society, then they're not bringing it back in. But I think we have to remember, they're not the only ones that are traveling outside of the household. The children are too, depending on their activities, right? And so you, you, do, you don't necessarily protect your entire household just by being vaccinated yourself. You still have to maintain the same practices that keep your entire household safe because you still have vulnerable members right there. Um, that is why you have sort of CDC guidelines about if you're a vaccinated household and another household that is low risk and unvaccinated, can you come together? Yes, in a very small setting, right? Um, but when you start thinking about larger settings, again, sporting events, um, you know, sort of community events, those are really just prime locations still for people who are not vaccinated to actually shared with each other. Um, so I think you have to really think about that as a parent, right? I don't think anybody in this group will ever tell you what, what to do and what not to do with your family. But I think those are the things that you have to calculate at the back of your head in terms of how safe is it to actually bring my unvaccinated family to a setting where there's plenty of other people who may or may not be vaccinated and I just don't have any control over that situation. You know? Which speaks to the importance of still wearing your mask and your face shield. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Any additional thoughts or things that you would like to share that we haven't uh, covered thus far? I saw that there was a question in the chat uh, regarding mandatory vaccination. And I, I know that that has been uh, a matter of discussion. I'll. I'll I'll mute for a second and I, um, Michelle, would you like to start out with that? Right, um, yeah, so so that's that's always the concern, right? Or I think that people have floated, especially on the heels of, of you know, flu fall campaign where we have mandatory vaccination. And, and certainly we have seen other organizations, other healthcare organizations, and now we're also seeing colleges and even certain um, schools, high schools, beginning to think through what that can look like. Um, it's a balance, right? When you think about somebody who is going to have to protect an entire community of people, whether they're your employees, your students, um, your faculty, your staff, um, you're gonna have to balance that out with the idea of, well, how much do I really feel like I could protect them in this setting with a number of people not vaccinated versus can I, 
can I make it simpler for everybody and just vaccinate everybody so that I know that within the setting they are safe, right? And there are a lot of things that go into that calculation, not just the not just the EUA, but really sort of how I think uh, people think about how responsive their community is and all that. So let's just say this. Let let's be very clear that that if that decision point ever happens. It will definitely happen with a lot of consideration for what is existing policy, what is the best science, what is truly best for our caregivers, and also what is best for our patients. Because we are in a unique position to be in a setting where we take care of the vulnerable. Right. Um, think, Susan, Rita. I was um, paying attention to some of the questions in the chat just to make sure that we were answering them appropriately. Yeah, no, I have no other further comments. I think I echo strongly with what Dr. Medina had said previously. Um, Dr. Reem, if you have any. Yeah, right now I'm only, I'm aware of only one hospital system in the US which is mandating vaccines and that's uh, Methodist uh, Hospital in, in Houston. And um, I know that they, well, they, they certainly have a lot of vulnerable patients there. We, we certainly do as well. So, uh, you know, it, this is something that uh, is a, an extremely thorny ethical problem as mm -hmm. well as a, a, a medical dilemma uh, at this moment. So uh, stay tuned. I have a positive note too. I didn't. I just thought of is that seventy percent of our caregivers are vaccinated now. Yeah. So, without the mandate, seventy percent have agreed to be vaccinated. So I think that's really positive. And I feel like the, the remaining thirty percent, there are people that um, are hesitant. And hopefully today, from talking with us, they'll um, they'll come on over to their to our side and become vaccinated too. So. Definitely, that's a good segue for one of my questions here that will come in from one of our caregivers. They want to know tips to encourage someone who is strongly against vaccines without alienating them. We know mm -hmm. that there are pockets in our community that are really apprehensive uh, about vaccinations um, for many reasons. And just your thoughts in regards to, uh, you, that's a layered question, of course, historically there are apprehensions on taking vaccines and medications. Um, but really, I think this caregiver really wants to support um, mm -hmm. someone and encourage them to get the vaccine and really wants to know how they can do that without alienating them. So there's layers to that. The thoughts around encouraging um, people but and supporting them at the same time I guess. Well, I always say lead with the carrot and not the stick. <laughs> I think you have to emphasize the benefits of it um, and again the fact that we do know that it's safe. To Rita's point, imagine what you could do to be able to see your family, to be able to hug um, your, your mother, to be able to hug your family members, right? Yeah. Um, and and when, when you start with that, then typically it's not, it's not about your judgment of their decision. It's about really you sort of inviting them to think about this situation a little bit differently. And I guess really trying to understand their concerns, you know, it might be, it, it, they might've had a bad experience with something else, or um, like you were saying before, Terry, maybe have a little bit mistrust in the healthcare system um, and just trying to understand the concerns. I was getting some glasses at Costco and, and, and the interaction was really helpful. Like she asked me, she saw, she asked me where I worked and I said, I worked at the Cleveland Clinic and, and it turned into be a COVID vaccine talk. <laughs> so as I was getting my glasses, um, but one of the things that um, she had expressed was that she was scared. And, and, and I think that's fair. And I, you know, just validated that it is a scary time and it's okay to be scared. Um, but at the end of the, I did get my glasses and at the end, she promised me <laughs> to get her vaccine. So we felt like it was a win-win. Um, but just yeah, what, to understand what people are, you know, where, where they're coming from. 
It's a great story. And, and I'd like to think that many of the people on the call will also themselves be able to be vaccine ambassadors, so to speak, uh, from the standpoint of being a source of, of information and, uh, and objectivity. Um, and what you said, Rita, was so important because um, the empathic approach mm -hmm. is critical. Yeah. Uh, that there's usually emotion behind people who are, are, are not taking vaccine. They're, and uh, to be able to non, using a non-judgmental approach and, and hear it and be able to respond to questions, I think is, is one of the most powerful things we can do and a, and a great gift to, the, to others around us. Well, thank you so much. I wanna be respectful of everyone's time and say thank you to our subject matter experts and our panelists today. We've learned quite a bit. We hope that the information shared today from these trusted voices will help you make an educated decision uh, about receiving the vaccine and moving forward. The vaccine can greatly reduce the risk of severe illness and possible death as we discussed. This is time of great uncertainty, but Cleveland Clinic's goal is always to aim you, arm you with tools and accurate information. And I think we definitely received quite a bit of education and information today from Dr. Office, Dr. Medina and Dr. Reen. Thank you again. The conversation does not end here. We have a variety of virtual events that are scheduled in the community and can and continue to answer, can continue to answer your question and your concerns if you have any. Please look for future communications. And I believe there is a resource right in front of you on the page here today. And we hope that you continue to reference our resource page. Cleveland Clinic COVID uh, link on the front uh, page of the Today page and also Langston Hughes Primary Care uh, vaccine information. There you go, outpatient care. They are also eager to engage you and your family and the community's needs. Thank you again, everyone. And please continue to send your questions and your concerns our way. And we look forward to engaging you in, in our future activities. Thank you. Thank you.